and thank you for watching this presentation, Central Oregon Bioregional Herbalism. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the Community Relations Team at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month we explore a theme, and this month's theme is wild. Our presenter is Holly Hutton, a clinical herbalist, teacher, and grower of medicinal herbs. She is a faculty member of the East-West School of Planetary Herbology and holds an East-West Certified Herbalist Certificate. Holly owns Herbal Goddess Medicinals, a small herbal products company, and she teaches at Central Oregon Community College. Thank you so much, Holly, for sharing more about our bioregions plants and ethical foraging. Thank you for inviting me. Great topic. So today I'm going to talk about some medicinal herbs that grow in and around Crook Deschutes in Jefferson counties. But first I want to start our conversation about how to, how does one go about learning about plants which are medicinal and how to identify them? First, it starts with learning about our history and which plants have been used medicinally. For this, we will look to those who have lived in this geographical era, namely Native Americans. In Central Oregon, historically, this land was not occupied, but was part of various tribes' seasonal rounds which basically means that folks would travel through the area throughout the year, harvesting animals, fish, food, and plants to be used personally or traded with other tribes. Primarily, this included the Warm Springs, Northern Paiute, and Wasco tribes, all of which are affiliated with the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. Most of what I have learned about local plants comes by way of reading ethnographies that were conducted in the early to mid 1900s of tribes within Central Oregon are those that live within similar plant communities. Although most of these plants were used historically, there has been a resurgence in some of these modern herbal circles. The second step in the process is to have a working knowledge of plant identification. This book was written from the perspective of an herbalist, so it has both plant identification information as well as some info about each plant's or plant family's medicinal qualities. The second important step is to have a field guide. There are many available and I have a list of books at the end of the presentation that I use for plant identifications and medicinal information. Once you identify a plant, um, or if there's one that you know that you want to find out if it grows locally, you can always look it up in the USDA plant database, which gives you an idea where it grows um, in each county in the United States. This is not always completely accurate, but it's still worth a look. So before we get started, one of the reasons that I'm always a bit hesitant to teach this class is that I hold a deep respect for these plants and I want to ensure that they are cared for ethically. I would like to go over a few thoughts on ethical wildcrafting. First of all, follow the abundance. Many of the plants that I will talk about are not prolific in Central Oregon. Therefore, it is important to ensure that there is a plentiful supply and that you are not depleting it. The good rule of thumb is to only harvest 10% of what is available. When you are harvesting roots, try to make sure that you cover up the hole so it looks like it did before you came, basically, so the idea is just to leave no trace. Another point, I have a slide at the end of the show that points you to various medicine making techniques that I will um, be using words for, like infusion, decoction, tinctures, and poultices. Um, so at the end of the slide, there are some how-to places to go and find the information. So let's get started. I wanted to start with plants in the Apiacea family or carrot or parsley family, since it contains several poisonous plants. And that's always the best place to start is to know what plants are poisonous. This is one of the most important plant patterns to learn. Notice how all the stems of the flowers cluster radiate from a single point at the end of a stalk. It's kind of like an umbrella. At the end of each of these flower stems, there is another umbrella of even smaller stems, hence the whole idea of a compact umbrella shape. This is an example of the first plant that we are going to talk about called Oshala. And you will see how, how 
similar, it looks to water hemlock or poison hemlock. The link on the slide is a YouTube video that explains how to identify hemlocks, which is a really important uh, first step to take before you would go out and harvest any of these plants. Oshala, our Lagusticum gray eye, um, is very similar to Osha if you have that frame of reference. Um, Oshala is on the endangered list and is something that we try to avoid harvesting unless it's plentiful. Um, Oshala has a diaphoretic action due to its, the large amount of essential oils that help to increase the circulation and promote sweating, make it, making it really perfect for use of colds and flus. Um, it has been said to rival echinacea and its immune boosting qualities, as well it, as it has antiviral and antibacterial actions, making it useful for upper respiratory and general infections. Its essential oils are also carminative, meaning it will help with indigestion as well. This is a plant that I would be very respectful of in that it isn't very abundant. When I harvest it, I will often spread the seeds and plant them back into the hole that I dig. I typically make a tincture of the root. Another plant in this family is Western Sweet Sisley. It was used extensively by many Native American tribes, in particular the Paiutes. It has a licorice-like taste and scent. It is also composed of a lot of essential oils. The roots are the part which most often are used medicinally, but the leaves are also used for a tea or when you're wanting a slight anise flavor, you can also use it for cooking. Uh, or in soups. It was used for colds, flus, coughs, and to help break a fever. It has a host of actions, including to address indigestion, and more recent research has pointed to its ability to regulate blood sugar. If this wasn't enough, it is also can be used topically for bites, swelling, and toothache. This can made, be made into a tincture, or it can be used as a poultice. The next plant that we're gonna talk about is uh, bear stem biscuit root. Um, this is pretty prolific throughout central Oregon and it has a long history of use. In this case, the most often are the seeds that are utilized. The seeds are chewed, chewed for a sore throat aid then swallowed to help loosen the phlegm in the system. They can be ground and used as a poultice for sore and swollen breast, arthritis, or any other kind of pain. Native Americans used an infusion of seeds for pregnant women at delivery to ensure an easy birth. The Thompson tribes used a strong decoction of the whole plant for colds and to break a fever. Early pioneers used a decoction of the seeds and were, they would also combine it with strawberry leaves and peppercorns uh, to dress coals because it's very warming to the system. I have uh, combined this, the seeds from this plant with fennel and cumin seeds as an after dinner digesting mix for relieving gas, increasing you know, digestive performance and addressing indigestion. Um, Many of the plants uh, in the buttercup family are not used medicinally. There is one very highly poisonous plant that grows locally, which is used in traditional Chinese medicine, and it is called uh, monk's hood. Um, you can find that up, well, you can find it in lots of places, but certainly up in the Ochakos. Uh, and that should be totally avoided, not touched at all. Western metaru, the leaves are edible, um, either raw or cooked. The root contains berberine, similar to what other herbs such as golden seal or Oregon grape root, which is typically used uh, because they have antibacterial properties. The seeds are used similarly to biscuit root, which I talked about just a little while ago, where the seeds are ground and it can also be used as a poultice for any kind of rheumatism or aches and pains. The roots have been shown to have analgesic properties and have been used for re relieving uh, migraine headaches. I have tinctured the root to use with a combination of herbs for pain. It is currently being studied as a possible cancer herb. 
This plant is uh, known as red baneberry. Uh, this grows pretty prolifically in the Ochacos, hence there's a, a trail called Baneberry Trail. The berries are toxic, but the roots are used medicinally. The roots uh, are used for dull, achy muscles, menstrual cramps, hypertension, and insomnia. The plant relaxes blood vessels to promote cardiovascular circulation and aid in the free flow of energy through the muscles to address fibromyalgia pain, urinary cramping, or muscle spasms. The root also reduces hypertension. It's a diaphoretic, so it also can be used for um, opening up the pores and uh, relieving fever. It also helps to calm the nervous system. It's been compared uh, as very close to black cohosh in its use, and it's the fresh uh, root tincture that is used. The lily acea leaves, uh, are any, and you can see that in this picture, all of the uh, veins run parallel. Um, it's a huge family of plants, including some of which are poisonous. So we'll also go over those. Um, the first plant that we're gonna talk about is false hellborn. Um, this is a, a very, very poisonous uh, plant. The roots are five to 10 times um, as poisonous as are the leaves and stems. The poisonous substances in false hellborn are steroidal alkaloids. Despite this, both the Piutes and the Thompsonians use the plants externally. I personally would not recommend working with this plant at all. It's, a, it's beautiful and it can just be, you know, appreciated for its aesthetic qualities. Uh, a next plant to really avoid is uh, death camas. And this often will grow uh, pretty close to wild onions. And um, there have been cases where people have mistaken identi identity and um, have been poisoned. So this is something to be really, really cognizant of uh, as you go out and be you know, have a really good idea of plant identification uh, for this plant. Um, but that's all the, you know, toxic plants in this particular family. Um, but this plant I love, it's false Solomon seal. And um, in this case, the berries are considered toxic, but um, you know, they should just be avoided. And when you use the plant, the berries are already uh, typically uh, dried out and no longer on the plant. Um, so the root uh, is the medicinal part of the plant. It's considered a demulcent, which means that it is, is composed of complex carbohydrates. This demulcent quality is viewed in traditional Chinese medicine as a yin tonic. And we don't have a lot of these kinds of plants in Central Oregon because we're a very dry environment. The root was used by Native Americans as a food source. I've used it in an infusion for broken bones, strains, tendons, ligaments, uh, injuries, any kind of arthritis or for slipped uh, herniated disc. Um, Jim McDonald is a well-known herbalist that has written a lot about this particular uh, plant. And he recommends a tincture of Solomon seal, mullein root, and horsetail for treating any of the above conditions that I was just talking about. It's really excellent for uh, any kind of uh, connective tissue injuries. Bead lily. The Kolowitz tribe used the juice from the smash plants as a wash for cuts and sore eyes. The root juice was taken for UTI infections. A poultice of the roasted leaf was applied to wounds and to help stop bleeding. The leaves are edible as are the flowers. The very young leaves can be used in salads while the older leaves should be cooked. Um, I've only used this plant, not medicinally, but as an edible green uh, in the spring. The rosacea. All plants in this family are astringent and they work to tighten the, um, the connective tissues. Um, so the first plant in this family that we're going to talk about is woodland strawberries. Um, the parts that are used are the leaf and the root. It's a great first aid remedy um, when 
say you're out and you're with a campfire and you get a burn, all you have to do is chew up the leaves and apply it to the burn and it will stop the, um, um, you know, hurting and help to repair the tissues. Um, the roots of the plant can be chewed to uh, treat gum infections. Uh, a tea can be made with the leaf and the root to treat sore throats, UTIs, diarrhea, and any kind of stomach acidity um, or, you know, acid reflux. Woods rose. Um, the parts that are used of this plant are the hips, the flower, and the inner bark. Because we know it is in the rosacea family, we know it's an astringent, and therefore we know it would be good for healing wounds and addressing diarrhea. Locally, the Paiutes used a decoction of the root as a poultice for burns. They also used a decoction of the enter bark for colds and an infusion of the leaves as a spring tonic, which is just something that is used for clearing out the phlegm and uh, lymph glands uh, from just the accumulation of winter, not moving, eating pretty rich uh, foods. And it's just a way to clean out the system. The Thompson, Thompson tribe used rose hips to help women in labor to hasten delivery. And a decoction of the roots was taken by women after childbirth to tonify the uterus. Uh, similar to how we use rose hips, uh, other kinds of rose hips. Um, they also made a decoction of the branches of uh, rose petals, choke cherries, and willows um, for diarrhea and vomiting. And then pioneer women used the hips of the wild rose in jelly puddings and in making syrups. The next family of herbs that we're gonna talk about is uh, those in the buckwheat family. Buckwheat has simple toothless leaves and often swollen joints, nodes on the stems, plus lots of small flowers and clusters. Um, this is a surprising one to me. I, this is not in any of the books uh, that I read, but because I'm a trained in traditional Chinese medicine, this is a plant that they use in China all the time. And this is something that grows in our sidewalks uh, along uh, any kind of disturbed soil. Um, this is actually a plant used, like I said, in traditional Chinese medicine. It's used in treating parasites, especially roundworm, hookworm, and is used in jaundice. It is a safe and effective astringent and a diuretic herb that is mainly used in treatment uh, for hemorrhoids and uh, dysentery uh, issues. It is also taken in the treatment of pulmonary uh, complaints because the silic acid, it contains strengthens the connective tissues in the lungs. Its diuretic properties make it useful in removing stones and the above ground parts uh, is what this um, uh, plant is used. I typically will make an infusion out of this and use it. Another plant that we see growing everywhere where is curly dock, um, <clears throat> which I'm sure you've all seen. Curly dock leaves are high in beta carotene, vitamin C, and zinc. The seeds are rich in calcium and fiber, while well low in protein and fat. An infusion of the seeds is used for dysentery. An infusion of the root is used for athlete's foot infections. The dried powder leaves can be used on wounds and sores. The roots tone and cool the digestive system, and it's good for acid reflux or any kind of increasing the lymphatic circulation if there's any swollen glands. Uh, internally and externally, it's used for addressing skin conditions um, like acne, eczema, and any kind of skin eruptions. It, it works on the liver, so it's really good for cleansing the liver. Heartleaf buckwheat. It's also astringent because it's in this family and it's used internally and externally. A decoction of the roots and stems can be taken for colds to heal wounds and to stop diarrhea. A poultice of smashed leaves can be applied to cuts and an infusion of leaves can be used for any kind of sore, infected sores um, externally. 
A tea of the leaves, roots, and stems were used for stomach pain historically. And lastly, a decoction of all the plants parts were used in steam baths for rheumatism. So this also is a very used plant. Uh, the next plant we're gonna talk about is uh, plants in the mint family. Mints are really super easy to identify. They have a four-sided stem or square stem with opposite leaves, and they're usually very uh, aromatic. There's several uh, native uh, mints in Central Oregon, but we're only going to talk about one. The one we're gonna talk about is nettle leaf giant hysop. Um, many of the mints uh, have a very cooling energy. This has a very warming energy. Um, the Okanagan Colville tribe used an infusion of the leaves for colds and fevers since all mints have essential oils and uh, they help uh, the pores to open up and release heat. Um, the Paiutes used a cold infusion for stomach pains and the leaves were applied to swellings. Uh, mints are also really useful for relieving gas and indigestion too. So this plant makes a really lovely um, tea uh, that you can make. The next plant that we're gonna talk about in, is in the sunflower um, seed family. And this is the largest family. There's about 19,000 species worldwide. And it ranges from all the way from dandelions to artichokes. So it encompasses it a lot. Um, arnica, we have two varieties of arnica here, cordifolia and latifolia. Um, Arnica is uh, only used externally and it's toxic if used internally. Most of what we buy in the store that is labeled uh, Arnica is from a homeopathic preparation, uh, which means that it's diluted uh, quite a bit. Uh, when I harvest this plant, I actually wear gloves um, and then I just get rid of them. Um, and then I let the flowers sit out. So all the, you know, to evaporate some of the water out and then I cover it with oil. I let it sit for several weeks. I shake it daily and then strain it. This preparation is very effective for addressing swelling, aches and pains, bruises. It should never be used on open wounds. Um, Arnica is in the endangered um, list. Um, and so this is one of those plants, if you were going to pick, you would only pick 10% of the, what you see uh, just to ensure that um, the plant continues to be prolific where you see it. Pearly everlasting. Um, this plant grows everywhere as well. And the parts that are used are the leaf and the flower. It's astringent and specific for the lungs to help stimulate the flow of mucus and reducing phlegm. It is used for seasonal allergies, runny nose, um, sore throats, and mouth sores. It's useful to the digestive tract, which is often tied to the production of phlegm and in cases of diarrhea. Externally, it is used for bruises, wounds, and also sunburns. Um, it's used in herbal smoking blends to help clear phlegm from the lungs. Several plants that I'm gonna talk about are, um, can be used as a smoking mixture to help um, uh, decongest the lungs. Um, er the next plant that we're gonna talk about is arrow leaf balsam. This is one of my favorite medicinal plants in central Oregon with its bright yellow flowers and its highly aromatic roots. The parts that are used are the leaves and the root. I make a cough syrup out of the root, which is quite resinousy and helpful for loosening phlegm and resolving congestion. Um, balsam root has antimicrobial actions. It's an expectorant and with recent in-search research its ability to stimulate white blood cell activity, much like echinacea as well. Topically, balsam root serves to disinfect, reduce inflammation and enhance healing. Powdered balsam root leaves can be applied to the burns, wounds to help soothe eczema and ease the pain associated with bruises and contusions and athlete's foot. 
A poultice of the mass, mash roots can be applied to insect bites and swellings. Native American tribes used a decoction of the root rubbed into the hair and scalp to help hair grow. And young stems and leaves can be uh, eaten uh, raw in a salad. Um, this is a very, very hard plant to harvest. Uh, I actually have a, a metal stick called, a, a, um, and it helps me to dig the root because it's usually embedded between rocks. Um, so I usually, every year I will harvest maybe two roots. Um, Another plant that we see everywhere is rabbit brush. We're really surrounded by rabbit brush. And yes, it was used medicinally, although I haven't tried it yet. Native Americans use rabbit brush for chewing gum, tea, cough syrup, and to treat chest, chest pains. The parts that were used are the leaf and the flowers. In, an infusion was used by the Klamath, the Thompson, and the Okanagan tribes for stomach aches, colds, coughs, menstrual pain, and as just a general tonic. The leaf and stem infusions were also used for externally for treating sores and skin uh, eruptions. And of course, sagebrush, um, Artemisia tridente uh, was used by the Okanagan uh, Colville, the Paiute and the Thompson tribe. Many of the tribes used it similarly. Similarly, uh, that being said, I would only advocate for its use externally due to some toxic phytochemical constituents. Externally, it has many uses, including as a poultice for fresh and dried leaves for chest colds, as a wash made of the leaves and stems for cuts and wounds, and as a leaf decoction for an eye wash for irritated eyes. The leaves are powdered and used for diaper rash, athlete's foot, and lastly, a decoction was used in a bath for muscle, uh, muscle ailments. Again, I just have to emphasize that this is something that should only be used externally. And of course, yarrow. Um, yarrow is a plant that grows everywhere in Central Oregon. Its name comes from Achilles, who put yarrow directly on his soldiers' wounds to stop hemorrhaging. The parts that are used are basically all parts of the plant are used. Um, this is a great first aid plant. The leaves can be chewed and applied to a wound to stop uh, bleeding immediately. It can also be good for any kind of stings, um, uh, wasp stings, et cetera, bee stings. It's a great herb for breaking a sweat in that it has diaphoretic properties. So it's really good to use if somebody has a fever. Um, it is used for addressing menstrual issues, including painful and sluggish menses. Um, yarrow is an astringent and can be used in a sitz bath for fibroid um, and or as a douche. Um, you chew the roots to alleviate tooth or gum pain. And lastly, the tincture is really bitter, but uh, I use it in my digestive bitters, which help to stimulate um, digestion. The next plant uh, family that we're going to talk about um, is the evening primrose family and almost all the plants in this family have edible flowers. Um, they're usually astringent, mucilaginous, and they all have some antispasmodic properties. So one uh, plant that we see growing around here extensively is fireweed. Um, parts that are used are the leaf and the root. It is high in tannins, making it astringent for use in soothing irritated tissues and reducing inflammation. Traditional uses for this herb are for gastrointestinal issues, for kidney and bladder infections, for menstrual disorders, for urinary tract infections, diarrhea, mouth lesions, and irritable bowel syndrome, as well as enlarged prostate. It is also proven useful in controlling urinary incontinence in both men and women. Externally, an ointment of the mash roots is made from the plant to treat children's skin conditions, 
for eczema, rosacea, or other skin conditions, the flowers are edible and used in salads. And of course, evening primrose uh, is yet another plant that grows throughout central Oregon. Um, you may know that the oil is often used, available in health food stores, but the plant can also be used medicinally. Um, primrose plant contains a high concentration of a fatty acid called GLA. This helps with healing itchy red skin irritations, including eczema, so you can use it externally. For this, you would harvest the roots, smash them, and then infuse it in oil. A tea made from the roots is also used in the treatment of uh, obesity due to, because it has a lot of co complex carbohydrates in it. Many modern herbalists use the roots in cough syrup for congestion. The leaves and the flowers are edible and can be added to salad. The first year roots can be peeled and boiled for 20 to 30 minutes and served with butter. Pine trees, both ponderosa and lodgepole pine, as well as what I'm gonna say applies to really all pines. The plant parts that are used are the bark, the needle, pitch and pollen. An infusion of pine needle supplies very valuable vitamin C. The needles can also be used as a steam to help open up the sinuses. The resin has antimicrobial properties and can be used both externally and internally. The resin had, oh, the pine resin can be soaked in oil and used topically for skin issues, cuts, wounds, burns, aches, and pain. It is valued for its beneficial effect on the respiratory system and was used to treat various lung and chest conditions. The branches can be used in an herbal steam bath as a treatment for muscular pains. Pine pollen can be extremely helpful for boosting both endocrine and immune functions. And it's really simple to consume by just sprinkling it on food. Brown's peony. This also is one of my favorite plants. Um, this is one that I'm, I'm much more, uh, have a lot of reluctance uh, in harvesting because it does not grow that prolific here. Um, the fresh root tincture uh, can be used for general pain, a spasmodic pain of the uterus and GI tract, as well as any kind of spasmodic cough. A decoction has, be, has been used in the treatment of pneumonia, tuberculosis, nausea, indigestion, diarrhea, and kidney troubles. A decoction of the sun-dried roots has been used to help people put on weight and an infusion of the root has been used as a wash for sore eyes. A cold infusion of the seeds has also been used as cough medicine. This similar, this species is very, very similar to a uh, peony uh, that is used in traditional Chinese medicine for nourishing blood and moving energy to address pain and spasms. Elderberry. Elderberry, again, we have some elderberry. Uh, it's not prolific. Um, we have two types of elderberry. We have red elderberry and we have black uh, elderberry. The red elderberry berries, uh, the red are considered toxic and the, the black elderberries need to be cooked before consumed. Um, the parts that are used on the elderberry are the bark, the root, the leaves, the berries, and the flowers. Elderberry flowers are traditionally used to help to break a fever. And then the cooked um, berries are effective against colds, flus, and viruses. There's been a great deal of research recently on its use in boosting the immune system. Hence all the products that you see at various stores. Um, a poultice of the leaves or the bark can be used topically on bruises, uh, eczema, and swelling. And juice of leaves and berries can be used both on uh, wounds and salves. Um, <clears throat> this is something that I use uh, in my local um, salves of products. Um, so I take elderberry leaves, yarrow leaves, and chickweed, and a few other uh, 
local herbs and uh, soak them in oil and that becomes, you know, a healing salve. Sitka valerian um, is our own native species that grows in central Oregon. Valerian is well known and frequently used medicinal herb that has a long history of efficiency as a nerve relaxant. It is considered a nerveline and for most people it has a calming effect. Although for some people like me, it has the exact opposite reaction. It makes me kind of hyper. Valerian has been shown to encourage sleep, improve sweep, sleep quality, and to reduce uh, blood pressure. It is also used internally in the treatment of painful menstruation, cramps, hypertension, and irritable bowel syndrome. Externally, it can be used to treat eczema, um, ulcers, and minor injuries. The fresh root is about three times as effective as the dry root. Um, and again, this is a plant that uh, in some areas grows fairly prolifically, uh, but you know, just be warned not to harvest too much. Um, creeping Oregon grape. Um, this is one that is, this is the actual uh, Oregon, uh, the Oregon grape species that is used medicinally versus the great big bush that you see planted in some people's yard. The root contains berberine, which is a water soluble alkaloid that helps to detoxify our liver and blood. Oregon grape root uses have traditionally included treating both liver congestion and uh, infectious conditions of the stomach and the intestines. Another benefit of Oregon grape roots is it's functioning as an antimicrobial. Um, and this is where it really shines. Um, it basically is um, there has a historical uh, use in treating psoriasis and any kind of dermatitis. And so putting it in a salve can be quite helpful. And the last plant that we're gonna talk about is mullen. Um, lots of people know about mullen, um, but not everybody knows all the different parts that are used. Mullen is such a useful plant and all parts of the plants are used with the exception of the stem. The leaves are infused or decocted to treat cough, whooping cough, bronchitis, hoarseness, and relief phlegm. When making a decoction or infusion of the leaves, make sure that you use a coffee filter for straining to ensure that the hairs of the plant are uh, removed from what you're making. It's very specific for addressing a dry horse cough. Externally, the leaf is applied to wounds, bruises, hemorrhoids, and skin irritations. People also smoke this plant uh, in order to address lung conditions and uh, congestions. And the flowers of the plant are very specific if you infuse them in oil for treating ear aches. Uh, I, I swear by this one. Um, and then mullen roots are anti-inflammatory and can be infused in an oil for uh, the external treatment of aches, pains, and as a decoction for treating irritated eyes and for dressing bladder control uh, issues. So as we close out this presentation, which has provided you with an overview of some of the plants that have a history of medicinal use in Central Oregon, there are many more that I have discovered. And then I invite you, if you're interested, to move forward in learning by purchasing a book that covers information about some of these plants. Um, and so here's some uh, reference books that, uh, particularly the Pacific Northwest medicinal plants, uh, I feel is a you know pretty comprehensive uh, for many of the plants throughout Oregon. Um, and as an aside, in the summer, I typically uh, will do a uh, a wild crafting class where we go out through COCC and uh, identify some of these plants, and I'll talk about them. I don't know if it will happen this year or not. Um, these are just some additional resources that you can look to um, that contains uh, information about the plants that are here. 
And then this is the links to the medicine making. So we have a poultice tincture, infusion tea, oil infusion, and an herbal decoction. Um, thank you so much for listening. And if you have any other questions, feel free to contact me. And thank you for taking the time to listen and be good stewards of the land. Thank you so much, Holly. That was really thorough. And I really appreciated how you started off, you know, with a word of caution that, you know, we do live on a sensitive, in a sensitive area, and we do need to be and not contributing to um, taking away these plants um, from other animals that need them or uh, other species that use these, but to be very mm -hmm. careful. Yep, for sure. And it constantly surprises me, you know, how the plants that like mullein and rabbit brush, things that we just start to overlook as part of the landscape, they um, have benefits that we don't even know or underutilize. So thank you for spotlighting <laughs> some of those, not just the super rare ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, wonderful. Well, so the, those of you in the audience, thank you for joining us. We have a lot of wonderful programs on deck every month that are fun, free, and virtual. You can go to our monthly event guide or to our event calendar to shootslibrary.org forward slash calendar. And I will try to get a lot of these links in the description below. So thank you again, Holly. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm.